everyone. Marine Technologies, Charlie graduated from uh, the Technion in Electrical Engineering, and did a postdoc in Scripps in the USA, and now since, since four years she is here, and she will uh, tell us about her fascinating work. Okay, thanks, Joab. <laughs> uh, so I'm running the Marine Imaging Lab in the Marine Technologies Department. If any of you haven't uh, visited our facility down in the uh, IOLR, come see the robot and the new facility, it's nice. Uh, today I'll talk about the activities in my lab. So I'm uh, looking at optical imaging, and as you know, uh, it's very challenging. We have uh, many issues. We have visibility issues, uh, color issues, scattering, refraction. There is a problem of movement, uh, scale, and uh, also dynamic range. So maybe from all the marine sensors, the optical, the cameras are the maybe least used sensors in the ocean, but there are many opportunities in using uh, cameras. They are the only sensors who that will give you the colors of objects, more uh, finer resolution details, more than uh, acoustic sensors and so on. We can also get 3D uh, information from uh, cameras and uh, if you compare them to acoustic sensors, they consume considerably less energy, they're cheaper and smaller. So that's maybe, maybe there is a trade-off in the data, but when you look at all the autonomous vehicles, ROVs and so on, the costs of them, the sizes, and how much the acoustic sensors occupy, if you can uh, do at least some of the tasks you do with the acoustic sensors with the optical cameras, then you can reduce costs, minimize the size, and then eventually you get cheaper robots, will be able to deploy them more, and so on. So there are advantages also uh, with this respect. So in my lab, I kind of divided uh, the activities to three uh, topics. Uh, one is uh, underwater computer vision algorithms. You see an example on the top. Uh, we also look at uh, designing and building uh, novel underwater imaging systems, and we also work with uh, marine autonomous vehicles. Uh, so today I have how many minutes? <laughs> okay, so I want the main uh, uh, goal of this talk is to give an overview. So you are familiar with what I'm doing, and I think there are many points of uh, potential collaboration. Uh, but I will, so I will, I want to elaborate on one of our algorithms. I know I'm coming from a different background and field, but I'll go a little bit into the details and then uh, I think it will be, hopefully it will be interesting for you because I want to speak a little bit about what happens to the light in water and how we approach this uh, problem and how we uh, design the solutions. And I. I will also talk a little bit about cameras. So many people ask me about choosing cameras and so on. So hopefully when you see what happens in this algorithm, you'll have a better sense also of uh, how to choose a camera for underwater uh, photography. And then I'll give kind of an overview of uh, other projects. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions and so on. Okay, so uh, our first, the algorithm I want to show you is a a method for scene restoration from a single image. So, that's the laser. So you see here a few examples. The idea is now note that two of them are underwater and one is from a, not underwater, it's a haze image, but the optical model for haze is very similar to underwater. So underwater it's a bit more complicated what happens in the, for the, in the light, but when you look at imaging in haze and fog, there are similar phenomena to underwater. So the idea here is to take a single input image. We don't have any other information about the scene. And we want from that to reconstruct the clear scene. So you have here the examples in haze and underwater. 
And what do I mean by clear stream? We want to have the scene as if it was imaged without water between the camera and the scene. Okay, so how do we do it? But first, what happens to the light underwater? So first I want to say our algorithms are designed, uh, are based on the physical image formation model. So we look at what happens to the light while it propagates from the object to the camera, and then we try to reverse the process. So it's not like just uh, trying to apply random Photoshop filters and so on. We try to inverse the physical model to get the, the as much uh, accurate reconstruction as possible. Okay, so we have an, here an illustration of, we have a camera and it's looking at the scene underwater. So there is some water between the camera and the object. Now. There are two things that we are mainly concentrating on, which are attenuation and scattering. So I'll come here. <laughs> so when the light uh, leaves the object, if you look, this is a, a illustration of one ray. So this is one ray going to one pixel in the camera. The light leaves the object and then it gets attenuated on the way to the camera. Okay, and the attenuation is exponential in, it's exponential, and the, uh, it's related to, beta is the attenuation coefficient. So the attenuation coefficient depends on the water type, which means it changes with the location, time, and so on. And this is the distance that's traveled. So the further the object is, it, the more attenuated it is, and you, all of you go uh, diving, swimming, and you know that, and that's the main difficulty in reconstructing underwater scenes, is that the um, image deterioration depends on the distance of the objects. So things that are small, they're pretty clear and visible, and things that are further away, it's harder to see them. So we need to apply different corrections to different areas uh, in the picture. So this is attenuation. Any question, by the way? Okay. And we look at scattering. So when we look at the same pixel, at the same uh, light ray, we have some light that's coming from, in this example, it's from the sun. So the sun, there are sun rays that hit all the, the entire volume between the camera and the object. And some of them are scattered back into the camera because the uh, particles in the water, they scatter light to all directions. So then what we have here, that's an interesting signal. Note that the signal comes, is accumulated in the camera, but it didn't come from the object itself, okay? So we have an additional signal that's unrelated to the object at all. So here we could have whatever, coral sediments, whatever here, it won't affect the, uh, this component of the signal. And this is accumulated along the light ray. So again, if the object is further away, there is more scattered light that is accumulated and this component is larger. And this component is an additive component, so it reduces the contrast in the images and also lowers the quality of the image. Okay, okay. So this is a <laughs> an example. We put identical color cards uh, just outside the lab in Shikmona. And the spaces between them are approximately one meter. And we took this picture for illustration. And on the right, you see zoom-ins on the cards. And you see that the quality of the, uh, quality of the image deteriorates with the distance. I mean, you knew that already. <laughs> um, but uh, now, after I explain you about the attenuation scattering, let's look at the equation. This is the pointer. Okay, so I told you we look at the physical uh, image formation model. And this is, uh, I won't show many equations, but <laughs> this is the basic one. I is the pixel value, okay? So in each pixel we have three values for each color channel. We have RGB for each pixel. X is the uh, spatial coordinate, so that's the coordinate of a specific pixel in the image. And the intensity of the pixel, the pixel value is, um, uh, it contains two additive components. J is the original scene color. So this is the value we want to reconstruct. 
and t is the, trans t is the transmission. The transmission is the exponent I showed you before. <coughs> so the, the trans it's called transmission because it goes from between 0 to 1. It is 1 when d equals 0. So when the object, the uh, distance between the camera and the object is minimal, we have maximum transmission, we have maximum of the signal. And when it's further away, it goes down slow exponentially to 0. And this is the additive component of the scattering. So we have here, this is a global uh, value, A. And this is actually, this is the value of the image when we have no object. So I equals A when T equals 0, right? You see that from the equation. So when does T equals 0? When we are very far from the camera. So if you look at this image, all this, this is the scattering value. So this is uh, the color of just the scattering without objects in the scene. Now, this image formation model, you see it's symmetric and nice. This is because uh, it's for ambient illumination and for sun illumination, we assume that the illumination is uniform, which is not always true with the sun, but generally it happens. We assume that every, uh, the sun is spread uh, uniformly, it hits the uh, surface uniformly, and then each object gets the same. Whatever you, you are, you get the same amount of sunlight. This is true when you look horizontally, so more or less when the scene is horizontal. Okay, I feel I lost you a bit, and are there any questions? No, yeah. Absorption? Yeah, yeah, so this, everything goes here. This is the absorption. The attenuation is composed of absorption and scattering. I didn't say that, that's a good question. And the attenuation coefficient depends on the, uh, uh, all the particles in the water. So carbon, organic particles, and so on. Okay? Um, okay. So now we want, sorry? Yeah, yeah, so everything is wavelength dependence, dependent, but the camera, that's a good point. It, has, it doesn't measure wavelengths, we measure three colors, RGB. So this is per color channel, it's not per wavelength. I mean, it's true per wavelength, but we cannot measure, we cannot, not with the camera, we cannot work per wavelength. Yeah, it's a tricky question. We have a paper about that, <laughs> just about that. I'll elaborate a bit uh, later. So yeah. No, that's why we have the C sub uh, index here. It indicates that the beta changes per color. I'll talk about uh, yeah. Actually, that's the next uh, slide, yeah. <laughs> It's a good question. So, uh, but before that, what do we want to reconstruct? So the input, we only have I, and we want to reconstruct J, this is the clear uh, scene, okay? And J is, a, it's in bold, I don't know if you see, because we have three colors, one per uh, color, one number per color channel. So as, uh, from one pixel, for each pixel, we have three equations. We have three color channels, but uh, and we try to solve the equation, but we have more unknowns than the uh, inputs. So we have the three unknowns of uh, the unknown scene. We have three inputs. This is a global parameter. I showed you that it's just the color of the horizon. And we have theoretically three unknowns because the uh, transmission per color channel changes. It's not exactly three unknowns because if you look at it, we have Per pixel, we have one unknown, which is the distance of the object. We assume we don't know the distances. And we have also the three, these are global unknowns, the attenuation per color channel. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so this and also the assumption of the uniform illumination. Yeah, so, but I think the actually, the uniform illumination is a, a trickier assumption than the uh, consistency of the water because if you look at the visibility range, it's 20 meters. Usually, you don't have many changes in 20 meters unless you're in like special thermoclines or something like that. Then it won't work. Okay, now, 
but one before I show you how we solve it, uh, one important thing: all this is really we we use the camera as a physical sensor. So here we assume the f uh, the pixel actually measures the light intensity that falls on it, and for that to be true, the images we acquire have to be linear. And what does it mean? Uh, I don't know. I know everybody now. Uh, I <laughs> takes pictures with their cell phones, but if you use the or using an SLR camera or just uh, higher-end cameras, you know that if you look at the file format, there are raw formats and JPEG and so on. So when you have a raw format in the camera, then it gives you uh, physical measurements. It means that the image is linear with the light intensity that falls on it. If you are imaging a JPEG or whatever, then you lose this linearity, you lose this quality of the camera because the, um, the light intensity, then when the camera saves the, um, the picture, it, uh, it transforms the values a bit and then this equation no longer holds. So if you ask yourself, that's why if you want to do, usually if you want to do uh, more complicated manipulations on images, it's important to image at raw, even if you don't use our algorithm, but other algorithms, most of them uh, benefit from having uh, what's called linear images, that you actually use the images as physical, uh, physical sensors. So that's one thing to look at when you're uh, shooting underwater. It's always better to acquire raw, and then you can transform it to JPEG and not start with JPEG, and then you inherently lose information in that. Uh, so that's one thing I wanted to say, to tell you. So that was, uh, I was against GoPros. I know I'm recorded. <laughs> but uh, now I think I was told the latest ver GoPro version actually enable RAW. I, we didn't check it yet, but that's uh, one uh, important thing to note. Okay, so one thing about, uh, all asked about the betas. Uh, here we, there, there is a, uh, a Swedish scientist in the f uh, 50s, his name is Yerlov, he did uh, many optical measurements of the ocean and he divided the water types to more or less to 10 water types. And you can see here an illustration of them. So he had uh, Greek numbers for open o ocean waters and uh, one to nine coastal waters. And this actually kind of represents the um, uh, uh, the uh, particles in the, co the concentrations of the particles in the sea. So you have, if you have more organic uh, particles, carbon particles, and so on, they all of them react to wavelengths, absorb uh, different wavelengths in different matters, and then this uh, changes the color of the water. So this is an illustration my uh, Daria, my postdoc, made, and then for each water type, what will be the uh, water color per each depth? So it gives you a feeling of more or less the class optical classification of ocean waters ar around the world. And also more recent uh, measurements uh, show that these are more or less representative of the oceans. And if you look at, the, attenu at uh, the graphs, so this is the graph of the attenuation coefficient, the uh, beta is a function of lambda. So this is the wavelength. And this is a logarithmic scale of the attenuation. So you can see there, is a, there are big changes between wavelengths. You know that. You know that red attenuates faster than blue and green. But the ratio between them depends on the heavily depends on the water type and also the amount, the amount of the attenuation. So this explains you the difference even in the Mediterranean. You know that you have very clear water and uh, clear days. And then there are days where the visibility in the Mediterranean is shitty. So this represents the visibility. The, um, the higher the uh, attenuation coefficient, then we have less visibility, okay? Because this goes in the exponent. Okay, so in this method, I told you we need to know also the attenuation coefficients. We assume we don't know them uh, a priori, although you can say, okay, I know I dive in a lot. A lot is more or less the same water type. In the Mediterranean, it, it changes. But what we're doing uh, in this algorithm is we're estimating the attenuation from the images, from the image itself. So we're guessing also the water type from the image. And how do we do that? So first, this uh, goes back to your question you have here. We did a simplistic thing of 
what happens is that the camera images, each color channel images a wide range of wavelengths. So you actually need to integrate over it and, all, and so on. As I told you, we have an entire paper about that because it's not so simple, but I won't go into that. But here, we just took the values from peak wavelengths uh, for each color channel. So for the blue, we have got a representative value, green and red. So we simplified a little bit the, this issue. So roughly the blue goes from 400 to 500, r roughly, but it's not uniform. It has a response, more or less a Gaussian response. So we took the wavelength that is the peak of the Gaussian. The same green is a little bit less than 500 to 600, and red is 500, 550 to 650, something like that. And it's, it's like more or less Gaussian shapes. Uh, okay. And then we can, so from here we can take the ratios at these wavelengths. <coughs> now I know this is the scariest line, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, it's not so uh, difficult. So we looked at the ratios between these betas and then the original equation, I showed you uh, one line, but it was uh, three equations, one per color channel. We can transform them using these betas and then we get to a simplified form where we have only, f not only, but we have four unknowns per pixel. We still have, it's still an underdetermined uh, equation system. We're still missing something. What we added to solve it is an image prior. Now, I already, I, I won't go into these details because I already a little bit lost you, but this is a s uh, simplified form that we can solve using some priors on the image. And and this is how we reconstruct the image. So the one thing is that we don't know, I told you there are 10 types, we don't know the types, and in order to get to this form, we no need to know them. So what we do, we do the reconstruction with the 10 water types, and then we choose the best one, which is maybe not a very sophisticated way, but <laughs> it works until now. So here is an example. For this uh, image, I'll show you the input image. Uh, actually, this is the input image. I don't have it in the slide. Okay, so we took this diving in Akhsholim. And these are three suggestions of our algorithm for reconstructions for different water types, open ocean, coastal water, and coastal water. And what you see here are the estimated transmissions. So as I told you, we need to know the distance of the object in order to reconstruct the scene. So the algorithm simultaneously estimates the distance of the object. So you see here the distance maps where red is closer to the camera is, and blue is further away. So you see that each water type changes the rec both the reconstruction and the estimated uh, distance map. And what we do, we do it, so we do it 10 times and we automatically choose uh, for what we think is the best reconstruction uh, it's automatic, so it's you know it's not perfect. Here we chose uh, this one, and you see the distance map more or less uh, makes sense. Okay, so this is uh, the pipeline of the method. You have questions or <laughs> all questions? No, <laughs> many. Um, okay, so just I'll tell you a little bit how uh, the intuition between behind that. So this is the scene you already saw. And as I told you, we have an extra unknown that we need to estimate. So how does it work? Uh, the it's not exactly what we do, but the intuition behind it is that if you look at this image, you can more or less guess the distances of the objects from the image quality. What do I mean? The close, the nearby objects, they look better, right? They have better contrast and better colors. And the objects that are further away, you see that the scattering element kind of veils them. It's an additive component and the contrast is lower. So for example, what we can do is to locally estimate the contrast in each area of the image. So imagine we would divide it to squares and we estimate the contrast. There are con measures for contrast in the images. So we will have here higher contrast and lower here. So this can gives you, give you more or less an indication about the distance. You say, okay, this, is, this area has a lower contrast, so the object is further away. We, don't, we do something a little bit more sophisticated, but this is the intuition of how to estimate the distances from just uh, this image. 
So I'll show you a few uh, examples, and we'll go to more maybe fun stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so this is uh, what I showed you, just uh, the RS, the reconstruction, and if you look at the areas that are further away, you can see we uh, improved the contrast and uh, the colors. This is the estimated transmission. This is a scene from a lot. And this is our result. Again, look at the further areas, okay? Because this is a, uh, where you can actually test the algorithm. Because if you take this input image, put it into Photoshop, or you know, you have some filters on the phones, so you can improve, you can easily improve the images, but usually only on the close areas. Why? Because all these filters, they uh, work globally in the images. They do, they apply the same correction on the entire image. But what you need to do is to apply a different correction depending on the distance. So if you look here, we have also in the further area pretty good improvement. And also uh, this is the distance map. And what's nice here that we are able to distinguish these poles also. So the algorithm can distinguish them from the background. That's the next slide. <laughs> uh, so what we did is that we, we or maybe my, I think all the entire group went diving for this project because we didn't want to just download images and because then we don't have an objective criteria. So we did two things to have an objective criteria. One, we dove with the stereo system, so two cameras. Now you might know that from two cameras you can reconstruct distances of the scene. So we have the true distances from the, you can see, I don't know if you see here that it's a two camera set. But we didn't use that for the algorithm. We, we use it for the distance. And we also placed the color cards you saw, we placed five or six of them in every scene. So now we have two objective criteria. One, how is our transmission compared to the ground truth distance? Compared, these are other methods, okay? So the transmission is not in absolute distances, so we measure correlation, and ours is uh, much better. <laughs> and I don't have it here, but we can also show the colors on the color card, so we expect them to be the same along the distances, and we are, we're also better in these. So uh, we are actually still acquiring, so there are no data sets uh, available, uh, so we're also going publishing this data set with the ground truth information, and it's a uh, hard work, because <laughs> you know the color cards are weighted, so they don't move in the scene, so there we have the divers carrying uh, six color cards, place, arrange them nicely in the scene, take the picture, then move on, arrange them. So we are slowly acquiring more scenes, but we have now m around 20 scenes that we're compiling for an uh, uh, online data set. So that's about, uh, any questions about that? Okay, so, mm, well. um, it's, well, it, you need, at some turbidity it will fail. We are actually, we starting to do more uh, elaborate tests with that just because the, you lose the signal. So here we look at the three color channels. If you start losing the red and the green, yeah. um, so, but of course, the turbidity changes your visibility range. So it will do something, but we didn't test it in very high turbidity yet. Um, okay, so this was maybe the more uh, heavy equation part, but I wanted to give you a sense of uh, what, what we are doing and how we are approaching problems. Just one thing about uh, strobes. So I told you uh, ambient light is more uniform, it's easier, the equations are easier. When you lose, use a flash, and you usually need a flash, so it's, uh, the light pattern is not uniform, so the phenomena are the same. You have light attenuation, but note, so here, the light is attenuated also when you go from the strobe to the object and on the way back. And there is also, when you have point light sources, there is uh, what's called the free space fall off. This is not because of the water. This happens also when you turn on a uh, flashlight at air. The intensity drops with one over the dist squared distance. Like think about it, when you illuminate, 
it uh, like the light intensity falls off with the distance also outside water so this adds this complicates the equation and also for the scattering we have also the same integral over the line of sight of each pixel but the intensity that comes to each scattering event is different from the uh, light source so also for this the the equation this complicates the equation we do have some i won't go into the details of this but we are also working on uh, and i'll look here again so what we showed here is that so what happens with the light sources is that the equations are more difficult but on the other hand you have the light source so you can use it for some calibrations and so on so it's an advantage and this a disadvantage but you also have some advantages so here we show that if you just take pictures of the light source and move it. So here there are no objects in the scene. What you see here is just the backscatter from the light, from the flashlight. We can actually calibrate the attenuation coefficients, do some color corrections, and so on. I want, this is another talk, so <laughs> I won't go into the details of that. But uh, we're also, so here we don't have a sing what we call the single image method. We need to do some uh, pre-calibrations, but once we did them, then we can apply the correction on single images once we uh, use that. So here we work, as I said, told you, we work for color channels. So you want it to be, if it's if you want to measure to do the calibration for every color channel, you need it to be white or at least have intensity in each color channel. If you want, but here we do it independently. So. If you have a blue light source, you will calibrate only the blue attenuation. Hmm? Um, yeah, it can work for m multiple light sources, but you don't need, like here you don't need them just to measure attenu the attenuation. Uh, one is enough. But I have to say this is, here we need a specific setup to actually move it forward. We're trying to now to uh, advance that and have less constraints on the hardware. But we showed the proof of concept that we can use. Uh, what's nice here is that you can calibrate stuff without having uh, calibration cards. So people sometimes put calibration cards, color cards, and so on. And here we can calibrate the water properties without having any calibration targets. So that was the point of this paper. I admit the hardware is not the simplest <laughs> hardware. The configuration can be uh, improved. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's one over R square, but in the R direction, in the distance direction. But if you look at these directions, it's usually a cosine or a Gaussian. So the one over R square is per one light ray. So that's true, it doesn't depend on the reflector. But yeah, we calibrated here, we calibrated the light in the lab for the, this uh, reflector uh, attenuation. So that's what I said. It complicates your life when you have strobes, but you have them so you can do some sorts of calibrations. So here we had to do a few calibrations. I'm just not going over the details. More questions? Okay. And what we think is that this method can maybe work also for cars driving in fog, but we didn't try it yet. Okay. Now, this is work in progress. Um, but just to show you, there is potential. Uh, as you know, so the visibility is limited, and this relates to your uh, question about turbidity. The far if you zoom in into the further objects, you can see it's very noisy. But we're working on uh, improving that, and we show that there is some improvement that can be made. Uh, it's still work in progress, and actually I think we changed the algorithm since <laughs> we <laughs> had these results. But it shows uh, potential in improving the visibility. Okay. So this was the part about uh, the algorithms. Now I want to show you a few movies about systems uh, we develop and so on. So one thing, we have a project funded by the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Space. Um, and we bought a small hovering AUV, this one. 
Yeah, I'll show you a movie. In the meanwhile, so this is a movie of uh, the deployment of it. So what's nice about this AUV is that it's uh, hovering. So it can either hover or go slowly above the ground. And that's why it's suitable for high resolution images. If you think about uh, the other types of AUVs that are not hovering, they have a minimal, uh, minimal uh, speed they need to fly over the ground. And then it's harder to acquire high resolution uh, photographs. So here um, you see photographs of the AUV, but you won't see pictures we took with the AUV because it doesn't have cameras yet. <laughs> Uh, we just got this AUV in July, and we are now integrating uh, two cameras on it, uh, two cameras and also uh, high-intensity flashes. So, and the goal is to be able to fly slowly above the ground and take high-resolution color images of the ground and then stitch them together uh, to get a 3D mosaic uh, of the ground. Here you see it was the second day at sea, oh, it almost got stuck in the <laughs> anchor. <laughs> um, but what's nice about this AUV is that uh, it's pretty small. It weighs less than 60 kilograms. And then you saw the deployment of it. We can deploy it from a small boat. So the operation is relatively easy and cheaper than larger vehicles. And uh, for us, it's the main research uh, vehicle. You probably heard about the three kilometer uh, rated AUV that the school bought. So this is, I don't know if you saw it, it's a larger one. Um, and for us, this is a, this is a good uh, platform for research on uh, cameras, algorithms, maneuvering, and so on. Yeah, 200 meters, uh, good question. Yeah. So we we took the 200 meters because we actually we wanted a small flexible uh, vehicle. Um, okay, so that's uh, wait. Oh. Okay, so these are the plans for the AUV. We are integrating the cameras, so hopefully in a few months we will have them working. We'll start having some footage of uh, uh, the seafloor. Yeah. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, the well. Because it's actually limited to 200 meters, it has a DVL. So usually up to 200 meters, the DVL will be, will have bottom lock most of the time. And then once you have bottom lock on the DVL, the navigation accuracy inc increases. So usually you lose the navigation once you're in blue water, when you're too far from the, so because it's limited, so it has a DVL, USBL, and IMU, and together, especially with the DVL, once you have bottom lock, it's pretty good. So uh, we got it, I didn't say, we bought it from an uh, underwater robotics uh, lab in uh, Spain. So we bought it without the cameras, but with uh, their navigation uh, algorithms and uh, sensor suit. So it dif it's difficult to say exactly what the accuracy is. It depends on the current and so on. But uh, in these depths, it's actually, when you're close to the bottom, it's actually not bad. Yeah. Okay. So this is a different thing. Uh, this is a, until now a, sm a small project. It's actually a work of an undergrad student, but I wanted to show you the potential. Uh, we're uh, constantly collaborating with the electrical engineering department in the Technion for undergrad projects. So the undergrads there need to do uh, two projects during their um, degree. And they, they like, uh, getting uh, movies from the ocean, you know, sharks and so on. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's fun for them. So I'm saying that because if you hear what they did is they ran uh, an algorithm. This was a shark detection from uh, drones. This is from uh, the Moiskan uh, Marine Research Station in Zdotiam. They're doing uh, drone uh, shark research. And what the student uh, applied here is more or less state of the art uh, uh, image classification algorithms. He modified them a little bit, and this is the result of the undergrad project. So, which, but a very good undergrad. So, not all of the projects. So, the results are so good. But this shows you the potential if you have some uh, movies or images, and so uh, that you want maybe people to play with them. We can uh, uh, transfer them to and suggest them as projects. I think this is well. 
the shark movie is cool and also the result is pretty nice. <laughs> um, something else we did is, uh, I told you we are planning to do from the AUV uh, images to do 3D mosaics of the sea floor. So here, this is a project, this, is, this was taken by diving, it was two meters depth in uh, Nakhsholim. This was with the uh, Asaf Yasur Orlando from uh, Marine Civilization. And what you see here is a 3D reconstruction of, uh, they had uh, some rocks mixed with uh, some uh, archeological remains. This is uh, an ancient anchor and so on. So this is the, a few, two views of the 3D reconstruction we did from the cameras. Uh, this is another project with uh, uh, Morel, the Morel Gopper, the head of our department. We're working on uh, having an autonomous uh, jet ski. This is the only slide I have about it because it doesn't really work yet. <laughs> it's, a <laughs> it's a complicated project. But, well, it's actually not true. Um, there is some progress now. They, they can control it with a remote control. This is Morel's group. They work on the control and the stability of the jet ski. We're working on, uh, sorry, on the cameras and uh, we're behind here. <laughs> it's pretty difficult, but the idea is imagine once we have it, we can deploy other sensors on it and use it to map uh, shallow areas. Uh, this is maybe less related, uh, relevant to here, but we worked on uh, fluorescence, some fluorescence imaging systems. So we showed that uh, what you have here is uh, this, there are many small young corals in this picture. It's difficult to see them, uh, but they're here. We mark them. If you zoom in, you can see that there are actually small corals here. It's difficult to, sh to see them because when they're small, they mix with the uh, rocks and the sediment. But when you have a fluorescence image, it's even for me that I'm not a, a biologist, I can sh uh, spot them easily. And then, uh, so we have this camera system for wide field flu uh, in situ fluorescence. Um, I don't know if uh, it can help one of your projects. Now we are moving on to a multi-spectral camera. And the idea was the same idea that if you look at more, if you look be beyond the RGB cameras, so some things are difficult to uh, discover in RGB images, but if you have other modalities, fluorescence, multispectral, and so on, maybe it's easier to spot stuff. So with the fluorescence, it's really cool, but uh, not everything fluoresces. So we move to a uh, multispectral camera. This is also uh, in the works, but you see this is my postdoc diving um, with the camera. So uh, Morel designed uh, and his team, they designed a diver housing for the uh, multispectral camera. And uh, um, we don't really have uh, data from it yet. It's, uh, it, we just finished uh, developing it, but uh, the plan is to have, so this is the diver deployed camera and if we're happy with it, we might uh, also integrate it on the AUV. And then this can be, I think, maybe relevant to people here because it can give you more multispectral signatures of different sediment types and uh, so on. So you see we have for the diver uh, system, we have a screen and buttons and all that, okay. And I run. And the last thing I wanted to show you is are a few uh, in situ microscopic images. Um, so at the end of my postdoc, I developed this uh, in situ microscope, and the idea is to image uh, small scale organisms in their natural environment. So what would you, you would do until now is take water samples, bring them to the lab, right, and then inspect them with a microscope and so on. But then first you're limited with uh, the number of samples you can take, but you're also destructing the organisms, taking them out of their natural environment. So we have two uh, optical configurations for this microscope. One is a bright field uh, configuration. What it means is that you have the illumination the, the we have a strong LED that illuminates exactly onto, in onto the camera. And that's why it's called bright field. What happens is that the entire image is bright, as you see here, because we just shine the light into the camera. But how do we get the images? If there is an organism between the camera and the light, it absorbs uh, the light and it, and it looks uh, dark. So this is maybe 
the other way around of what you're used to seeing from p in pictures. Sorry, no, no. So these, uh, why do we need a bright field? Because most of these organisms are transparent. So if you'll just shine light from the side of the camera, nothing will come back. But the bright field is the simplest way to image transparent organisms. <coughs> it works on the absorption. You can do polarization, it will give you maybe a better contrast. But this is a simpler system as and more light efficient, which was important uh, here. So these are more or less the resolution we got. We can see 10 micron details. And this was, nothing is fixed here, okay? So the microscope is hanging from the boat on a rope. The sea is moving, everything is moving. We are not fixing anything. And we still get uh, these details. <coughs> Note that this is lucky imaging, okay? <laughs> we are <laughs> we're not focusing on anything or we cannot uh, try and follow one of the organisms. Whatever goes into focus uh, gets, uh, well, whenever we pull the trigger of the image, we get a nice image, okay? So we get many bad images, and then once in a while, depending on the concentration of the particles, we get uh, good images. Now we have some uh, attempts to f uh, float it and look at the sea surface. This is still uh, in progress. It's difficult, but we got some good uh, uh, images with that as well. And okay, and maybe you already saw this movie because I showed it a few times, but I'll show it again. So the other configuration is to look at non-transparent uh, organisms, and here we look at benthic organisms. So th if you want to image uh, coral polyps, they won't float into the focus. We need to focus uh, on them, and also we need to illuminate from the camera side. So it's uh, more complicated optically. And what you see here is a movie we took with, so the microscope is looking at two coral species. This is in a lot, and this is a time lapse we took overnight. So it's sped up. It's a few minutes that summarize six hours. And note that the width, the field of view is less than two millimeters, okay? So it's very small. And you can see the details of the polyps. And you can see this is an tally here. So this m gives you a rough idea of the scale because they are more or less 10 microns. And what you see here is that, well, they're fighting. <laughs> I didn't say that. And uh, you can see, so this is sped up a few hours uh, sped up. But uh, you can see the details, the temporal details of the, the fight and the spatial details. So what happens, how the fight evolves, and all that. It's uh, eight, seven, eight centimeters. And okay, so we have this movie and we have more movies online on the website of the paper. I wanted to show you, and the last thing I want, to, no, it's the last thing I want to show, the last movie, because uh, it might be relevant to some people here. So this was a uh, diver-operated system. And last year, uh, we mounted it. Uh, uh, we had a lot of press <laughs> on that and on, the on these movies. And last year, we mounted it on an ROV, just as a proof of concept to show whether we can use the microscope at deeper depth. So we integrated it electrically and mechanically. On an, this is the uh, not ROV, that's the Eco-Ocean ROV. And we went, we <coughs> deployed it to 80 meters in Eilat. So what's nice here is that it's integrated. Uh, actually, we planned it. So when they bought the ROV, my lab paid, I think we paid 7,000 euros just to have the connector so we are able to connect the microscope. Uh, we have the same connector also at the big R R big ROV. But what's nice is now that we can control the microscope from the control room of the, R of the ship. So together with controlling the ROV, we can change the focus and the exposure from the, uh, the boat itself. So I'll show you the movie. What we did there, uh, we did some work at 80 meters. So we, we see here 
the microscope is attached to the arm of the ROV and the pilot uses the arm to uh, direct it and to focus it and we can see the live view in the control room as uh, I told you we can see the live view of the uh, microscope. So here we had some uh, technical divers go down uh, also for the footage <laughs> but also to manipulate the corals a little bit and these are examples of uh, the images that we acquired through the ROV and you can see I'll show you soon the at some point they threw some sediment on the coral polyp and we watched it for two hours while it was cleaning itself from the sediment so that's coming in the movie yeah so this is this experiment so this is a few uh, sped up a little bit but you can see the coral cleaning itself from the sediment and you can see also the details of the <coughs> sediment so this is more or less the same resolution as I showed you before and look here there it's going to be interesting soon <laughs> as you see one particle got inside the mouth of the poly by accident but it's immediately emitting it outside which was nice to see uh, we accidentally captured it and yeah we have some uh, copy pod I think here yeah okay so that's the last thing uh, I wanted to show you and uh, if you have questions happy to answer